time. Join us right now uh, is Columbia Business School Professor Chomash Piskorsky. Good morning to you. Um, do you really think, I mean, and this, I, I was reading the study and the idea that if half the depositors left, uh, that would be a problem. Wouldn't that be a problem just about for everybody? And, and should a bank be prepared for that? Meaning what should be the threshold? Uh, thank you uh, for having me on. Just want to say this study is joined with Erika Jang, uh, Gregor Matfos, and Amit Serus. I talk on behalf of our team. So uh, you're absolutely right, but in principle, if uh, half of depositors would show up, the bank might not have enough of liquid um, assets, including cash, to pay them. But that's not really what we do. We really look on solvency of financial institutions. Essentially, we try to ask a question, is the market value of the assets, including the liquid ones, enough to pay the depositors. And uh, as you mentioned, our study finds that uh, market value of assets of banks decline about $2.2 trillion relative to their book value. And since banks are very thinly capitalized, a typical bank on you in US is financed 90% debt. Most of that is deposits. By that metric, about uh, half of close to a half of banks are in negative capitalization. In other words, the market value of the assets is not enough to cover the face value of the debt obligation. Right. Of course, as you mentioned, this is an extreme test. Uh, most of depositors are likely to stay, especially the insured ones. They don't care about solvency of banks, and they might also be willing to obtain a very low interest rate. So, so Tomas, what, what do you think the answer is? Uh, we've been having a, a sort of raging debate, as you know, uh, since SVB went down about whether there should be not just an implicit but an explicit uh, deposit guarantee. There's an interesting op-ed, uh, or I should say editorial, in the Wall Street Journal this morning, which effectively says this is a terrible idea, uh, that it effectively would allow banks to uh, run wild. They, they, they wouldn't have a sort of governor on them. We've talked about whether the customer acts as a governor on banks or not. What's your thought? So, yeah, from the Exante perspective, obviously, providing a lot of gar uh, deposit guarantees to banks and to depositors uh, raises the potential moral hazard issue. Uh, the problem is that the situation we are on right now, and I think this is what folks maybe didn't fully recognize, 37% of bank assets are financed with uninsured deposits. We are talking about $9 trillion in the system. These depositors are much more fragile. And they, in principle, not insured. Think about a CF CFO of a mid-sized company. He might hear assurances from Secretary Yellen and see the Fed is doing something about this. But, you know, you might still be tempted right. to move your assets somewhere else. And just to your point, you don't necessarily need 50 percent of them withdrawing money. 50 percent of them withdraw money. 190 banks right. are at risk. But even if just 10 percent does that, we find that more than 60 banks are at risk. So in that sense, to your question, exposed, I think the, the idea of trying to stabilize the system was a reasonable one. But, of course, it raises a broader question of but financial regulation of banks so going that's, forward. That's the question. I think we're all trying to grapple with it. I think, I think a lot of people agree, generally speaking, with the idea of guaranteeing the deposits, at least on a temporary basis, to try to stabilize the situation. But the flip side is, if this becomes a guarantee uh, for life, you're going to have concentration, by the way, uh, concentration risk. Companies, individuals, high net worth individuals, instead of spreading their money around at different banks, they'll obviously send it all to one bank. You know, th there are these unintended consequences of, of a guarantee. We've talked about the possibility of sort of guaranteeing a, a, a payroll account so that, so that businesses that have payroll can meet that. That seems like a, a, a fair way to approach this. But should, should it be a blanket or do you think when you look at it, it should be something else? Well, ideally, we wouldn't go full blanket unless it's absolutely needed. But I think going forward, we'd have to rethink uh, regulation, capital regulation of banks. Let me tell you one interesting piece of evidence. We have another paper when we look on what is the financial leverage of bank-like institutions that don't have access to deposit funding. Think about like Quicken loans in a mortgage market, the largest lender in the U.S. They are twice as much capitalized as U.S. banks. In other words, the access to deposit funding pushes banks to very high leverage. The institutions that don't have access to deposit funding endogenously, because market forces them to do, retain more than twice as big capital buffers. So if you want to think about sort of more broader insurance of deposits, I think it's sensible to start thinking about higher capital requirements, because as one of my collaborators would say, these banks are really levered like private equity funds or hedge funds, but they're financed with a short-term funding in the form of deposits and especially uninsured deposits.